All right, we now welcome on Jerem Jordan. You'll see him on any BYU TV sports broadcast. Jerem, how are we doing? I'm great. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's either myself or Spencer on almost everything, <laughs> right, which is pretty fun. Um, I, I have a very fun job. I'm, I'm very excited for you, Carter, that you have a podcast and you're doing this and that I'm not the best guest you've had, which is very, <laughs> very good for you. Appreciate it. Uh, so let's get this started. If I would have told you a year ago that Zach Wilson would have been a consensus lock number two pick in the NFL draft, what would you have said? I'd say, uh, wow, he must add a, a heck of a 2020 season. Um, that's incredible. Yeah, it's been amazing, right, um, what he's done in just one year. And I was thinking about this um, earlier today. All it takes is one great season. Kalani Sataki told me that earlier this year. Mm-hmm. Steve Young did not have a good junior year, but had a great senior year in 83. Mark Wilson in 79. Brandon Doman in 01. These are just some of the guys, uh, Steve Sarkeesian, 96. These are just some of the guys that had uh, a great season that led to something in the pros. And uh, in the case of three of those four quarterbacks I mentioned, they got drafted. But the fact that Zach is top five is a credit not only to BYU and Jeff Grimes and Ed Roderick and Klein Stockton. It's to Zach because we know the story of him driving to Southern California. But the way that he can throw the ball off platform all the different angles that he can throw the ball at, his athleticism, his mind. He is definitely a top five guy, which is pretty awesome to watch. So would you, if we had a different schedule, the original one we're playing Michigan State, all these power five schools, do you still think he goes top five? No, I I think he'd be uh, end of the first uh, or day two guys, uh, second or third round, because he would have been exposed a little more. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that doesn't mean he's not a good or great quarterback. I think Zach's amazing. Like you could still be a very good quarterback in the NFL, no matter what round you drafted at. Like look at Tom Brady, of course. Look at Russell Wilson in the fourth to my Seahawks. Like it that th- that doesn't matter as much. The opportunity is going to be given to you a little earlier if you're a higher pick, and and the criticism will be higher too. Like the danger in Zach being a top five pick is if it doesn't work out. We're going to remember him or not, like Rafael Araujo, 03, eighth pick, NBA draft out of BYU to the Raptors, didn't pan out. No one really talks about him. Really good college player, but I think Zach is going to have a successful pro career. I just hope it's a good fit with that team because you could be awesome, but if you get it, you have a crappy offensive line, good luck. If you had your choice, where's he going? Uh, well, Russell Wilson's still going, so not the Seahawks, I guess. Um, <laughs> although there's been some drama there recently. Probably, I don't want to say the Niners because I don't want to root against his team, but pro Zach, but it might be the Niners. I think they're, they're like a quality quarterback and health. They had a bunch mm-hmm. of injuries away from going back to the Super Bowl. Like two years ago, they're in the Super Bowl. Jimmy Garoppolo is a guy that at times will win you a game, but he's more of a just don't turn it over hand off, make the right play action pass on third down kind of, or second down kind of guy. If Zach Wilson was on the Niners and like could, could really show what he could do in the next couple of years. Oh my gosh. After Jimmy G's done, they could, they could be in the Super Bowl. Like that could be a great fit. I, I like the Falcons. Honestly, they have some, obviously some real good weapons and Calvin Ridley and Julio Jones and these guys offensively O lines fine. They have a brand new head coach. So who knows? I'm a little scared of the jets at two though, Carter, because yep. The Jets, because yep. Jets. So I, but Robert Sala is good defensive coordinator. Brought over Mike Lafleur with that offense. That's sort of a Niners-ish new team. Maybe it's the Jets. I don't know. I just don't want him to go to like. He's not going to Detroit. They got Goff. He's not going to the Bungles. Obviously, they have Joe Burrow. Like mm-hmm. it, the Washington football team. It's like, please no. I don't like that um, fit. But Panthers there, there's trade some good up. ones out there. They could trade up, right? Saints would be interesting. Like, are mm-hmm. they in on Taysom Hill long term or not? Yeah, I would be surprised if they are. If I'm being honest, like, right? They gave him a shot. He did. He did uh, fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but was he was he good to gray? Like, eh, they played the Falcons twice. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we saw with BYU football this year, they had no chance, even if they went undefeated, to make a New York Six game. So, are we going to see BYU continue with these brutal Power Five schedules, or try and do? You know, Bama does. Their non-conference is playing the Citadel. Well, Bama always plays at least one good non-con game, right? Um, And every SEC team has that one FCS. Uh, And almost everybody has an FCS. 
my i've i've been on the hill and i'm gonna die on it probably or live on it i'm living on it um Mm -hmm. of i don't know why byu plays such hard schedule i think there's a balance between too easy and too hard right now it's too hard um last year was probably too easy right Mm -hmm. um byu went 11 and one and only had uh two games that were uh one two games that didn't go BYU's way by a large margin, obviously Coastal Carolina and then UTSA was a one score game. You have a close game, whatever you have a weird day. I'm in the camp of the following. Um, I want about three or four power fives. I don't want them all in a row. I don't want them all on the road either. Um, Three or four quality group of fives and then four to six um, winnable games. That's the model I think would be good because BYU has to, not only want to win to me it's like winning matters more than anything else it just does Mm -hmm. Uh, but you also have to appease ESPN you have to appease season ticket holders the boosters and so there's a delicate balance there for a guy like Tom Homo and now that we're going into year what 11 of independence um, Mm. it's hard to know exactly what it is what is it it's seven power fives in Boise State so I'm like hey seven and five staring down the barrel of that if BYU go wins eight or nine awesome uh I don't think this team's a four or five win team I think they're good enough with Jaron Hall or Baylor Romney or Jacob Conover although I never want to start a freshman quarterback I just don't Mm. no matter how good Jacob is it's like can he just sit for a year and then get his (laughs) chance later like (laughs) it was a free year last year whatever and he's a talented dude but yeah I I I think there's a place between what BYU has been doing and what last year was. Mm-hmm. So do we, do you want them to be in a conference or do you like independence more? It's a good question. And we've become pretty comfortable with not being in a conference. Mm-hmm. Um, like, like I assume that you're what 18 to 22 is somewhere. 20. Yeah. 20. Okay. So uh, you were like 10 or 11 when BYU went independent. Yeah. Like you barely know what the mountain West is like. Right? Those max hall mountain West games. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were, they were fun. And listen, it's fun to win a trophy. It's fun to win a conference. Um, but BYU has a lot of flexibility, not only financially more money from this than they would being in any group of five league. Mm-hmm. You can keep all the bowl game money. That's nice. Right. Um, you can play who you want a national schedule. BYU has this, you know, unique brand. They want to get out and play all over the country and play different kinds of teams. Yet it's fun when you play some familiar foes, but BYU still does every year, almost every year. Utah, not in 22 and 23 because of Florida, but Utah State, Boise State, and then you kind of go from there. So I, it all, it all kind of depends what you want. And I'm not on the go back to a league thing. Mm-hmm. If BYU go, like if BYU was invited to a Power 5 right now, I would take it no matter what league it was, yeah. which it's either Pac-12 or Big Big 12, mm-hmm. but I don't see the Pac-12 ever wanting BYU with Stanford and Cal. There's some real history there that goes back to the 60s. And uh, yeah, it's it's not going to happen. Big 12, uh, BYU got, uh, went on the Bachelor and got burned. They weren't handed the rose. No one was handed the rose a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And that was weird and awkward. So the money is good, but BYU's in a decent spot. They just need to win more. And mm-hmm. to win, the, the thing you control the most in winning to me isn't your players and coaches it's the schedule mm-hmm. in fact mark few said that in joe lenardi's new book about bracketology he said I'll, you know he said scheduling is probably the second biggest thing that that exists in, in trying to win games so i think byu learns from 2020 and just pulls off felt just a little bit i'm not saying be in fifth gear i'm just saying can we be in second or third and then win 10 games mm-hmm. so next season what do you see byu how, what do you see them how many wins maybe making a bowl game because it looks kind of brutal for next year right yeah seven power fives in Boise State yeah BYU should go to a bowl it's not hard to make a bowl game like if you don't mm-hmm. make a bowl game well this schedule you never know yeah when <laughs> I see BYU going uh, seven and five in the regular season going for eight in the bowl game if they're better than that that'll be awesome um if if they're worse than that like if you can't be six and six come on man like 80 <laughs> 80 teams go to a bowl game 80 like name the random mac team like akron's going to a bowl game like can byu please do that yeah so i I see it as seven and five just because seven power fives now the difference with this one versus other ones is that it's it's a little more manageable honestly it's not exactly what the ones before have been which is like all right we've stacked them up the front and we're in we're toast although you play three and so let's walk through it arizona in vegas Mm-hmm. absolutely winnable uh utah at home 
Hopefully the streak ends. That's always a tough game. Utah <laughs> always has a tremendous defense. Arizona State at home. That's a winnable game. Like, you're mm-hmm. on par with a mid-level Pac-12 team. Absolutely. South Florida at home. You don't think Jaron Hall and Baylor Romney are <laughs> itching to play that game after 2019? At Utah State. Utah State stinks right now. Come on. Uh, new, new coach, right? Uh, Boise State at home. I, it's not going to go like it did last year, but that's always a fun game, right? At Baylor. Oh, the Jeff Grimes, Eric Mateos Bowl, right? That's going to be a fun one. At Washington State. Mike Leach, uh, you know, ex ex Mike Leach connection up there, obviously is now uh, in in Mississippi. Virginia at home on my birthday. Bronco Mendenhall back in the house. These are Idaho State FCS uh, off. Uh, oh, I should mention Idaho State live on BYU TV, of course, probably. <laughs> um, at Georgia Southern, winnable game at USC. USC is the only one where I'm like, that's going to be tougher. Uh, and Utah, those two, I'm like, okay, those are real tough. The other ones, all winnable. Doesn't mean BYU is going to win all of them, but it, there's not a game where I'm like, yeah, BYU is going to get blown out at Baylor. No, I don't. I don't believe that. BYU beat USC a couple of years ago as well in Provo. All right, let's switch over to BYU basketball. So who knows what's going to go on with this all this COVID stuff? Is BYU going to play in the West Coast Conference tournament? It's a good question, and you're firing like all the right questions. By the way, good stuff. Appreciate it. But now there was a conversation, uh, you know. <clears throat> columnist out of uh, Portland mm-hmm. that probably spoke to Gonzaga and Gonzaga like spoke on behalf of BYU a little bit there saying, Oh yeah, we've been talking to BYU. I, I don't think that anyone from BYU has said that. Um, I think that's definitely a Gonzaga thing. In fact, I'd be surprised if Gonzaga goes to Vegas. I don't see mm-hmm. why they should. They don't need to. Why? And what? So they can beat everyone by 20. Like who cares? But with BYU, I think if BYU wins out in the regular season, that that should be a conversation that Cougars have because mm-hmm. Um, if Gonzaga pulls out, I kind of want BYU to win that tourney because they haven't won a conference tournament since 01 when UNLV was ineligible. So it was a similar mm-hmm. situation. And BYU just doesn't win tournament titles. Like BYU is terrible in conference yeah. tournaments. Like it doesn't win it, uh, which is shocking because BYU has been a good basketball program over the years. So I, I'd want BYU to go, but whether they're, I think there's a chance. Is it worth it? Is it worth the risk? Depends what you, yeah, yeah. The, and BYU is the, I th- I can't say this for sure, but I think BYU is the only team in the league that hasn't had a COVID issue. So yeah. do, do do you risk that? Yeah, yeah. Depends what you want. Like BYU is like, listen, this will help us get a better seed. Or maybe BYU is like, no, we're you firmly get a like worse eight. <laughs> right, right. Which by the way, I hate eight, nine. Yeah, you don't want to be an eight, nine BYU. too. I'd rather be 10, 11, or 12. So if BYU 100%. went, they lost, and they were 12, I'd be like, good job. You're you're not an 8-9. <laughs> but maybe BYU wins it and gets to a 7. Like, I don't I don't know. Do you see any chance BYU makes the second weekend of the tournament? Oh, yeah. Yeah. BYU is tough defensively, rebounds really well. Uh, at times, has been able to make three. Obviously, it's not last year. It just, it just doesn't. Mm-hmm. BYU doesn't have the guard line it did last year, but. There's, yes, I think BYU's got a shot, especially because that first round matchup is going to be a 50 50 ish kind of game. It's not going to mm-hmm. be, oh, BYU's like an eight point dog to whoever. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, if it's the eight nine, if they're in the eight nine game, they're essentially playing, they could play Baylor. I don't see BYU beating Baylor. Oh, you're saying through the second round, not to the second round. No, 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 to the second weekend. Oh, the second weekend. Sorry, yeah, I thought you meant the second round. No, no, I think they can make, win that first game. Okay, if BYU is in 8-9, it's going to be tough. But <laughs> here, here's the situation, though. BYU will have played Gonzaga twice mm-hmm. and had a taste. And now, if it's not Baylor and it's not Gonzaga, then maybe, maybe BYU's got a shot, right? I, I think if it's one of those two, it's going to be really difficult. But if it's somebody else, hey, maybe listen, we've seen crazy things in that tournament. And BYU defensively can match up with almost anybody. Uh, BYU's got quickness. They've got uh, rebounding. They've got the height. They just need to make some threes. So we saw BYU win 80 to 52 against Pacific last night. I think this is a testament to Mark Pope. Is it strange this team is a bet? It's going to finish with a better record than last year's. Um, no, because I don't think the strength schedule was as tough this year as last year. Um, going to Maui was was tough, but mm-hmm. yeah, you kind of look at it and go man, they made this out of nothing. If you looked at last year, you probably thought, oh, rebuild, dude. No, this has been reload, which is yeah. a credit to Mark Pope and his staff. 
And as long as he's here, BYU is going to recruit well, which is awesome. And right now, as we sit here on, you know, in February, there's going to be a transfer or two that go to BYU that we don't have on our radar right now, just because there I've, I've joked, it's the transfer nation of BYU where there's going to be these good dudes that show up because look at the staff, by the way. So you had Mark Pope and Chris Burgess both went to Duke and Washington, and then they transferred to Utah and Kentucky. They know that you can transfer and have a great existence somewhere else. They, they sell that. Mm -hmm. And now BYU, like blind resume. You got a kid from Gonzaga, Arizona, Purdue, Cal, Utah, Oklahoma state. That sounds pretty nice, right? (laughs) That's what it is. So what has to happen for BYU to make that second weekend? Like, is someone going to have to step up or what's going to have to happen? It depends on the matchup, but I, I don't see how you advance and shoot the three just in a mediocre way. I, I think you'd have to have one of those good nights from Alex Barcelo, Brandon Averitt, Trevin Nell. Hey, Caleb Lohner. Yeah, he looked great Five of six. Time. How about that, man? We we talked to him today on BYU Sports Station, and I asked him, How'd you, did you keep your, how'd you keep your confidence after starting over 12? And he said, I started over 12. Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> He's just like, has a great attitude about it. You know? So it's like life lesson there, man. Hey, you made a mistake or two. Mm-hmm. Like who cares? Like get after it, you know, be better. So who, who knows? I, I really like the fact that BYU is deep. Um, BYU has good rebounding defense. The only thing I don't like about BYU is its inability to shoot the three consistently mm-hmm. and, and like for volume in a game where it's like, if BYU has to win by winning the three, I I don't feel good about that. That's my only knock on this team. Has Matt Arms been disappointing for you? No, um, I didn't expect him to be like a 20 and 10 guy. I think, I think that before you go, because I think a lot of people are expecting him to be 20 and 10. Exactly. Yeah. He wasn't that guy at Purdue. He wasn't Mm -hmm. close to that. I don't like, yeah, I, I didn't see that. And, and frankly, he was like a four, rebounds a game guy at Purdue he wasn't a good rebounder um I wouldn't I wouldn't say rebounding is one of his strengths but he changes shots he just does if he doesn't get a block but the shot is missed and he contested it that doesn't show up in the box score and that's what he accounts for like layups at the rim are harder to come by when Matt Harms is in the game he also runs an excellent pick and roll offensively yes his numbers aren't exactly what you want them to be but riddle me this BYU is sitting as an NCAA tournament team, and they would not be without him. Um, mm-hmm. he, he is a big part of this. And, yeah, if you expected 20 and 10, sure, you're disappointed. But to expect 20 and 10 was a miscalculation from the beginning. I thought – I was hoping for him to be like a 12 and 7 guy and two blocks. A- and the fact that BYU goes 10 deep, that affects those numbers. Like mm-hmm. his per 40 is probably fine, but he's probably playing about 25 minutes a game. So what's this team going to look like next year? Who do you think leaves and who do you think stays? I think the three seniors are all gone. Uh, Matt Harms basically said as much. Uh, Brandon Averitz, I I bet he's out. And I bet Alex Barcelo is out. So it's going to be definitely a new look team. BYU needs to find a point guard. Uh, But BYU's got some exciting uh, talent coming back off missions um, and some freshmen. So it's going to be different. But here's the thing. I may not know exactly who's going to do what next year. Mm-hmm. But if Mark Pope's the coach, mm-hmm. he's going to exactly. figure it out. It's it's going to work. Like, I just have the utmost confidence in Mark. And this staff, like, a lot of people don't understand whether the staff's really good or not. When it's not that good, I'm not going to say anything out loud because I work for BYU. <laughs> <laughs> but this staff is excellent. Like, they are really good. BYU's had a lot of really good assistants over the years. And, and that's to Dave Rose's credit and Mark Pope's credit. If you're Alex Barsolo, though, why don't you stay? Um... Maybe he just has other pursuits he wants to get after. And he put in his two years here and, and you go after that. And he's, uh, while he is a BYU guy now, not everyone grows up wanting to be here for mm-hmm. like five years. And <laughs> sometimes you want to just move on. And I imagine he wants to get married to his girlfriend, Zoe, and, and, and bounce like she's a, an Arizona student. And I don't know what the situation is there. But yeah, they, I, you know, sometimes people want to move on. Like Gavin Baxter is going to be like a junior next year or senior. He's just going to be gone. He's not going to use yeah. that extra year either. He said that already. Just some guys don't want to be here forever. And there's a little more sort of antsiness associated with 
younger kids living now that just want to move to the next thing. Like mm -hmm. BYU, I went to BYU for like four and a half years. I used my red shirt academic year, you know, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to be here and I'm still here. Like I, not everyone uh, feels the same way. Right. Yeah. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> if, yeah. If, if, uh, if Alex yeah came back, I'd be ecstatic. That'd be awesome. Yeah. But all right, Jam, thank you so much for coming on. This was great. I had a ton of fun. Hope to have you on again soon. Oh, Carter, listen, what you're doing is awesome. Keep doing it. There's not a lot of kids your age doing this, getting into this, getting reps, talking to people that are interesting, unlike me. <laughs> um, yeah, this is awesome. Thanks for having me on, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, we now welcome on Kevin Sweeney. He's at Sports Illustrated. Also, the founder of College Basketball Central. Go check out the College Basketball Central podcast. Kevin, how are we doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. Any time. So let's start this off. Give us your background. Like, where are you from? And why did you start this uh, College Basketball Central thing? I mean, it's a, it's kind of a wild story. So I'm, so I'm from upstate New York. I'm from Albany, mm -hmm. New York. And for the listeners that don't know the area, it's, it's a very unique sports town in that Albany is large enough to be at least large enough to be a place, but it's not large enough to have any like pro teams of sorts, or even a big like FBS college football team. Mm -hmm. um, the University of Albany is at FCS and, you know, people root for Syracuse and stuff, but you know, there, there isn't, there isn't a team to latch onto people, you know, they're, they're Yankees fans and they're Giants fans and, you know, Knicks fans, whatever, but you know, there, there isn't a team to latch onto. And so Albany, almost takes on like a big East towns flavor where, you know, they, they root for their two college basketball teams, Sienna and Albany, particularly Sienna and Sienna is, you know, Sienna is a, a Mac school, but it, it's acted, it treat, it's treated like a big East program there. They play in a downtown arena that seats, you know, 15,000 and they put 7,000 butts in seats at games. And they were really good when I was growing up, they were, you know, when I was you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, they won the Mac every year. They beat Vanderbilt in the NCAA tournament one year. They beat Ohio State in the NCAA tournament one year. So, like, I was just kind of thrust into, you know, this world of, of mid-major college basketball in particular. Um, I have, you know, some pretty strong family ties in Siena. And so I just fell in love with them, fell in love with mid-major basketball as a whole. And my junior year of high school, so in 2016, yep, that's the year, um, I started – my little rinky dink WordPress blog so I could talk about college basketball. And I thought it was like the coolest thing ever. And, you know, kind of gradually went from, you know, I got a hundred Twitter followers. Wow. Like I've made it to, oop, but now I've got a thousand. Oop, now I've got 5,000. Now I know, you know, now 10,000 and I've kind of grown it while I've been here at Northwestern. I'm a student there. I'm a senior now. Um, you know, my freshman year at Northwestern, the first team that I had a press credential to cover with my little blog was, was Loyola Chicago. And that year was the year they made the final four. Uh, and so, you know, that, that was a really cool experience and further indoctrinated me into the, the world of college hoops. And now I'm a, I'm a senior. I'm an intern at Sports Illustrated and do a lot of their, their college basketball coverage this year. I'm their, their resident bracketologist, I guess. I do two bracketologists a week. I write a column every week. I do, you know, some feature stories. I wrote one actually about Lola Chicago just last week, which is a lot of fun. So, it's a little bit of everything. It's been, you know, quite the quite the journey, quite the ride, and uh, you know, very very appreciative of of everyone who's helped along the way because they think it, you know, really has taken taken a village of people who've been nicer to, the, to me than they really should have been. When I knew nothing, and I still don't know much, but you know, I know more than I did. So, uh, like, like I guess that's the story. It's a, it's a complex one. You know, started the podcast when I was, I think, just freshman in college, and kind of on a whim and that's gone really well so you just keep adding things to your plate eventually i'm gonna run out of hours in the day but i haven't yet so we're gonna keep plugging yeah and if you haven't checked it out go check it out right now uh college basketball central.com cbb central all right so let's start this off uh i'm a huge duke fan you obviously can see the background whatever uh is there any realistic way they make the ncaa tournament i, I think there's a path unlike with kentucky i think mm -hmm. there's a real path i think it would, it would have required them rattling off five five of the last six, I think, that are on the schedule, I think probably, and that would get you in the conversation. I also think the ACC tournament will be, you know, so wide open. I'm, I don't think I would be scared of Virginia right now. I mean, Virginia's a solid basketball team. They're not, they're, unbe they're not unbeatable. Certainly, they, Florida State made them look pretty bad just a couple nights ago. And Florida State's got talent, but their season's been very disrupted. And you know, where will they be come mid-March? So, 
you know, I think the path in the conference tournament is very viable for Duke. And, you know, I, 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 I think the big question for them is just, can they ever find some consistency? And there just hasn't been a stretch. I think you know, thought maybe when they won three straight in early January, you know, and, and they beat Wake Forest. Okay. Maybe they're turning the corner. Maybe they're turning the corner. And it just hasn't happened. The blowout went over Clemson. Okay. Maybe they're turning the corner and go on the road. lose Miami. So it's going to take a consistency that they haven't had, but I don't think, you know, I don't think this is like such a broken team the way Kentucky is or even Michigan State. I think this is a team that you know, could could conceivably make a push, although obviously without Jalen Johnson, the, the road gets a little bit more difficult. Yeah, so earlier this week, Duke Ford, Jalen Johnson announced that he was foregoing the rest of the season, opting out, whatever you want to call it. He quit, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, look, <laughs> I, I don't know Jalen Johnson. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to demonize the kid. It is what it is, but – there has been widespread conversation among the basketball industry, the people I know, people I don't know, that have told me, like, look, you know, he, his people were not happy with what his role was at Duke, with what the direction of Duke this season was. And at some point, it became a situation where it was easier for him not to play than to play. And he said, all right, I'm going to pack my bags. And that's fine. Right? Like, yeah. it's a business decision. I, I understand it. You know, he's going to have to answer for that business decision mm-hmm. when NBA scouts interview him come you know, April, May, June, whatever. But, but that's the bottom line. You know, he, he played eight minutes, and then the next day he packs up his locker. That That's not a coincidence, folks. Like, it is what it is. And, again, I don't, I, don't, I don't feel the need to, like, try to, like, assassinate his character like some people mm-hmm. have tried to do. I don't feel the need to be like, oh, we should pay back a scholarship. Like, yeah. what, like what are we doing? Like, but, but yeah, I mean, he, he quit on his team. Like, that's fine. And, and, and he, there, there's a reason why he was at three high schools in three years and, you know, quit IMG mid-year. Like, this, is, this isn't new. And it's something that he's going to have to answer for. He's as talented, I think, as probably anyone in this draft, maybe a little bit behind your, your Kate Cunningham, Seven Mobley's, and John Kamingas, but he's super, super talented. But, you know, he's going to have to answer for that. And, and really why this whole season at Duke, he's been – I would say a little bit uninter- uninterested on the court at times. And mm-hmm. I know people say, oh, he had the foot injury. I know no, his defense well. has been atrocious. He hasn't, he hasn't wanted to defend. Like, like it's, there, there are a lot of guys who are banged up who still go out and defend. Jalen Johnson yeah. hasn't gone out and defend. He has these flashy blocks. It'll be like regu- like January LeBron where you think, oh, you see this fancy block from House of Highlights from LeBron. But in reality, he didn't play a lick of defense in that game. Yeah, exactly. And I think the bottom line with him was like, he, I, don't, I don't think he ever was interested in being, you know, the one and done guy who leaves a legacy, right? Like mm-hmm. there are guys who come in and bring energy and, and, and toughness. You know, he was a lot more Cam Reddish than, than even RJ Barrett was, you know, than an RJ Barrett. He was a lot more, okay, I'm this talented talent kid. This is a pit stop on my path to the NBA and I'm going to treat it as such. And if everyone around me at Duke doesn't treat me with a certain level of, you know, of, of reverence and treat me with the talent that I am, then I'm going to see you later. And eventually he said, I'm going to see you later. So that's all I got. Yeah, my only problem with the whole thing is these like crazy Duke fans who are like, oh, you know, pay back the scholarship, like you said, or oh, he can't name him a Duke player anymore. He's done all this. It's like, all right, like don't kill the kid, but like he clearly quit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and I almost, and I think like there's a difference between being quitting and being a quitter. You know, like, I don't, I don't think we need to be like, oh, yeah, like Jalen Johnson quits at everything he does. Oh, he doesn't care. He's, you mm-hmm. know, he, he's, you know he, he doesn't want to work, whatever. All we know is the situation of Duke. Yeah. And the situation of Duke was he didn't want to work at Duke. He didn't want to fight through it. He didn't want to, you know, sit on the bench when Coach K didn't want to play him. He didn't, you know, he, he didn't want to go through the adversity of this team, you know, losing three straight. Right? Like, that's the bottom line. It, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's, not, it's nothing else. This situation does not look good for Jalen Johnson. And will, will Jalen Johnson be a top 10, top 15 pick? Yeah, he will be because he's six nine and does things on the basketball court that very few people can do. But again, he's going to have to answer for it, and I don't think that's wrong. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if this lit a spark under this Duke team. But all right, that's enough Duke talk. Uh, they're not good enough for more time. So <laughs> let's talk about the two biggest teams. Can anybody beat Gonzaga and Baylor? I think teams can. I don't think they're unbeatable, but I mm-hmm. will say this, and I've said this on a few different other shows as well. I think this Gonzaga team is the best college basketball team we have seen since the 38 and one Kentucky team. And I think that this Baylor team is really close right behind them. So Mm -hmm. these are two generationally good teams. And that 38 and one Kentucky team had a one next to its name because 
they were beatable. It was possible. Nope. Wisconsin did it. And I think you know there are teams out there that absolutely have the ability to do to do. I think a team like Iowa has the high. I think you're looking for high variance teams, right? Mm-hmm. Iowa could shoot, make 23s, and beat you. I know they don't defend. If they make 23s, they're <laughs> going to be tough to beat. Alabama, they defend and they can go make 15 23s. And that that's a team that that that, I, that strikes me as a team that could you know, do this. Do I think a team can just line up talent wise and just say, hey, you know? We're really we're we're a good basketball team. We're going to beat you. No, I don't think so. But mm-hmm. I think there are certainly some high variance teams that could pull it off, and I think there are some teams with star power that could go make a push, right? Like I think Iyasumu at Illinois is the clutchest player in college basketball, one of the clutchest players I've ever seen in this sport. And you know, if this game winds up close, they already played Baylor. That game, you know, the final score was eighty-two to sixty-nine. It was a lot closer than that. Baylor pulled away late. You know, Baylor just had a little bit more energy. I think Illinois will be much better positioned for a game like that come March. So, you know, it, I, I think they, both teams are beatable, but if you ask me, those two are the field, give me those two. Okay. That was my next question was, are you taking Gonzaga or Baylor or the field? I would take Gonzaga number one, Baylor number two, the field number three by the rank. Number that? three, who are you taking to beat them? Man. Um, top, who's the top of the field? Is it Michigan? I think I think it's Michigan. Yeah, I, I, th- yeah. I think it's Michigan. I think between the ability that that Hunter Dickinson has to control a game in the paint, combined with the fact that they have multiple guys who can beat you off the bounce, you know, Livers has improved so much in his career from shooter into full blown, you know, guy who could take you off the bounce, guy who can play pick and roll, etc. Mike Smith's been steady at point guard. Wagner is an impact impact player, both shooting the ball and defensively. You know, they have depth. I think I think Michigan is probably the third best team and the probably one of the only two to three teams in the country that could try to line up man for man with Gonzaga or Baylor and try to beat them. Mm-hmm. You know, the other teams, like I said, it's kind of more high, more a high variance situation where, OK, you know, we, we can shoot, shoot, shoot the ball out of the gym or OK, we're Houston. We can really defend and, and lock Gonzaga down and, you know, play low scoring game. Like, I think there are some situations like that. But I think, you know, if you just want to, you know, two teams playing their best basketball. Michigan is probably one of the only two to three teams in the country that has a shot against Gonzaga mm-hmm. Baylor. Yeah, my only concern with Gonzaga is playing in the West Coast Conference, you just cruise for through January and February. And, I, I mean, that's clearly why I feel like they're trying to schedule a non-conference game, right, as soon as possible because they have cruised. I mean, not one game has been remotely close. And I, I think that's a little concerning, honestly, with them um, mm-hmm. because – there have been some games where they didn't have to wake up. And I think the Pacific game was a really good example. There, there have been a few games where the first eight minutes they've gotten punched in the mouth and they're like, all right, we're going to make a run, maybe make a run. Yeah. Pacific, they let it happen for like 24 minutes. Mm-hmm. And they can't do that in the NCAA tournament. That, the day they beat Pacific by 18 points, they would have lost to a lot of teams that day. Maybe not, you know, not, not a 16 seed, maybe even not an 8-9 game. But in the Sweet 16, you better come ready. And, and we've seen, you know, I, I think the best – Honestly, example of a game where Gonzaga looked, you know, touchable was the West Virginia game. Yes. West Virginia was uh, probably going to be a four seed, maybe a three. Uh, and, and, you know, yes, Jalen Suggs wasn't healthy uh, throughout it, but, you know, they took away one option. He played, still played 26 minutes. And, you know, they took away Suggs. They took away Timmy for the most part. Timmy had his worst, one of his worst games of the year. And they hung it. West Virginia did. They were right there until the very end. And so, you know, to me, those are the types of teams that you start to say, okay, they might have a shot. They might have a shot. And I think the fact that they haven't been battle tested recently, look, like they're still really, really good. And and I, I'm not going to question the, you know, I'm certainly not going to question the schedule. They've played who they they played and they've done a really good job of scheduling those up games in the non-conference, but it is going to be an adjustment when they get thrown on the court with a team like West Virginia, the super athletic, when they've been dealing with Pacific and Pepperdine for the last month. Absolutely. So I'm going to give you some teams. You tell me whether you think they can make a legit run and tell me why. So let's start off Virginia. I don't think they can get past the Sweet 16. I don't, 100% I don't agree. I think first off, this is not a vintage Tony Bennett defense. You know, when you look at when you look at Ken Palm, this is the worst defense that Virginia's had since 2013. And this is not a team that's just locking you down, locking you down the way that you know other Virginia teams have. They don't have that in their arsenal. Now, are they better offensively? Yeah, they are. They're so much better offensively. The jump they've made has been incredible. And I do think, you know, to have three big guys in Hauser, Murphy, and Huff who can all shoot the three at such a high level, I mean, that's, that's going to be really hard to guard. They can, they can 
get on a run here, but we've seen against teams with upper level athleticism, Florida State and Gonzaga, that they haven't matched up well at all. And I think that's a huge concern. Combine that with the struggles against San Francisco and Kent State, you know, two teams that would probably be like 13 seeds. I think Virginia is vulnerable. And, and look, they've got, they got some time and, and they're going to figure it out. And I don't think they'll lose in the first round, but I, I also don't think this is a, you know, a final four sleeper waiting to happen. I don't, I don't think that's this type of team. Houston. I'm a believer. I really am. I think, you know, mentioned defense. This team really guards you. They mm-hmm. really get into you. Uh, they make every pass difficult. I remember very early in the season, they played Texas Tech in a news report game. And Texas Tech looked completely baffled as to how to get anything done offensively. Pretty much the only thing they ever got was some free throws. Mac McClung got to the line a bunch, basically by creating a shot one on five, and eventually we just get bumped. Mm-hmm. But this is a team that has two to three guys who can go create their own shot. Uh, Dejan Giroux, Quentin Grimes, uh, and Marcus Sasser can all go get a bucket. And then they're tough. They have guys who understand roles. Justin Gorham is transferred from Towson. You know, this is a guy who was not was not very good. You know, at his first year at Houston, and he has turned into one of the best rebounders in college basketball this season. He has been awesome and, and, and such an energy bringer for them. So, I think they could. You know, again, I think they will be. I mean, if people talk about the Gonzaga schedule. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of meat on the bone of this AAC schedule mm-hmm. they play a lot a lot of you know 125th ranked South Florida and 140th ranked Temple and and they get blown out by EC one random night yeah the East Carolina game like whatever it's one game whatever I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna judge about it but yeah. you know they haven't been tested and 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 they're gonna get tested a little bit here with Wichita and Cincinnati and Memphis down the stretch but I mean they're they're not they're not going to be coming off the rigors of a, of a season and maybe it benefits you to to a degree because you're not as banged up but mm-hmm. at the same time. You know, you line up for the first time against a, a Texas Tech caliber team in, you know, the, the round of 32 or the Sweet 16, different ballgame, different animal. This team's been getting a lot of hate lately, but Iowa. <sighs> Man. Because I hard. love Iowa. I, I just can't help myself. They're so much fun. I think, you know, Frederick, when he's around, is such a critical piece for them because yes. – you mean they're always, you know, spacing the floor and always have shooters out there that 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 make it makes them impossible to guard. I think they can make a run. I'm gonna say they can. Now, is I don't think they can win six in a row and win a championship, but do I think they could win four in a row? I, I mm. do. I, I think they could get to a final four, especially depending on matchups, because you know, they have the threat to shoot you out of the gym. And I do think they're a little bit more equipped than they've been to play a game when they don't shoot it great because of guys like Keegan Murray who can defend Connor McCaffrey and Joe Toussaint. It's still going to be tough if, if they don't make shots. And I think the, the, the game pressure will set in, but you know, this is the team that I think can make a final four. I'm not wedded to the idea, mm-hmm. but if you said, can they go? Or can they not? I think I would lean on the, yes, they can side. Alabama. Yes. hundred percent. Yes. I love, I love this team. I love NATO. I love them since he was at Buffalo. You know, really watched and charted his rise as a coach. And, you know, he, I, I think the, 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 the fun thing about Alabama is they packaged like Dan Tony ball into <laughs> a guy in NATO who once had his Buffalo coaching staff wear mechanic shirts in pregame because we're the tough basketball team and goes in press conferences and calls out coach K and goes in press conferences. You know, we had a COVID problem, but we wanted to play because, you know, because we think pausing is is not you know it, it is really because you don't want to play you know things like that like <laughs> he, he, he says these you know wild things and, and you know you don't have to agree with everything he has to say but he he is opinionated and he has a lot of fun and you know he is the perfect he is the perfect guy to bring like analytics of basketball into like random like you know southern college basketball <laughs> because you know, Alabama fans if you had like some math nerd if you had like Kyle Smith or Todd Golden you know former San Francisco guys, mm-hmm. if you had them walk into Alabama, they'd be like, get, get this guy out of here. Like, well, who, who is this guy? And there comes in with his, you know, Midwestern accent. And, you know, I, I think that we should, I, I think, I think your coach K wouldn't be saying what he's saying <laughs> if, 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 if he hadn't lost two straight. So, but by the way, we're never taking a bit range shot. You know, so, so <laughs> I love Nate. I think he's a perfect coach for this team. They're really, really talented. Like mm-hmm. that's the thing. They have three or four guys who are going to play in the NBA. They have shooters and, you know, combine that with the fact that they really get into you defensively. And, and that's going to matter come March. And I don't think anyone realizes in the country that they have the number two defense in Ken Pop. Like, no one realizes that. Mm-hmm. And it's it's credit to what Oaks has built. And I think they're a legit threat. I really do. I don't know why I don't believe in them, but Ohio State. 
it's hard for me to shake the memory of them losing to Northwestern when I was there like a month and a half ago, knowing mm-hmm. what I know now about Northwestern. Northwestern was a different team then. They're playing <laughs> a lot better, a lot more confident. They made threes, whatever. But it's hard to shake it. I think Ohio State might be the most accomplished team in the country with all of their quadrant one wins. They've done a terrific mm-hmm. job. I don't think they have a takeover player. I think they need that. I don't I think I think they will run into trouble, you know, once you hit the second weekend of the tournament when you're facing other elite teams. I don't know if they can string two together in a row and get to the final four. I'm gonna say no. I think they I think they bow out early. Oklahoma. I think they're 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 one man short. They're they're not quite talented enough. They're a really solid basketball team. Juan Cruz is an excellent, excellent coach. I was talking to Carlin Hartman, who's one of their assistants, uh, two weeks ago, and he was telling me, you know, you know, how, how much their season has changed since really a COVID issue sparked their, you know, their, 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 their problem solving. They basically, mm-hmm. they were playing two bigs. It wasn't really working. Brady Manick had, a, had, had COVID near their, their start shooting four man. And all of a sudden they're like, I guess we have to play Elijah Harkless, this six foot three, 200 pound bulldog of a guard from uh, transfer <laughs> Cal State Northridge. He comes in there, he's playing the four and all of a sudden everything starts working and it just clicks. And so they kind of found it by accident. Uh, and, and it's been kind of amazing to watch their growth. I just don't think they're quite talented enough to, to, to make a run like this. But Kruger's an excellent coach, and if they get the right matchups, watch out. Last one, Villanova. I'm not buying. I, I'm not. I, I don't think mm-hmm. they defend. Uh, and, and, and look, you know, people will tell us they're, they're lead offensively. Look at the numbers. They're lead offensively. Jay Wright, lead offensive coach. Great. The numbers say that. Put them on tape. Watch how many difficult shots they have to make. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, they have great shooters. They really do, but they take a lot of difficult shots. And it's because Colin Gillespie, Justin Moore, and Caleb Daniels, they aren't elite, you know, space creators. They aren't guys mm-hmm. who are, you know, going and get one off the bounce. And so their 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 easiest offense when they get it inside to Robin Snurl, they need to do that as much as they can. And 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 they're they're very soft. They're very well coached. You know, they do everything pretty well. But you know, I don't think they can win. If they get into a, get get against another team, they can really score. We saw that this weekend against Creighton. Creighton put some points up, and Villanova couldn't stay with them shot for shot. Mm-hmm. And that's concerning. So I'm I'm not in on the Villanova bandwagon this year. I'm really not in on anyone from the Big East right now. Just not yeah. buying it. So okay, what do you see the selection committee relying on most this year? Because we're going to see a lot of those weird like someone's going to be what like 15 and eight, and another team's going to be like 12 and four, or something weird like that. Do you see them relying on the eye test, strength of schedule? What do you see? I don't think they're going to re- reinvent the wheel. I think f- first off, once you have like a 15 plus game sample size, I don't think it matters too much. We saw them reward Michigan with the one seed in the top 16 reveal. Mm-hmm. I think you feel pretty good. I feel pretty good that the committee is not going to be like, oh, well, Michigan only played 15 games and Houston played 22 games. So, you know, Houston gets the nod over Michigan. Like, I don't think that's, that doesn't appear to be happening. I think they're going to rely on the metrics for the most part, but they're not going to be wedded to them. Obviously, like a team like Colgate is somehow still top 15 in the net. I don't think they're getting an at-large bid. They're nowhere close to that. Um, I think for the most part, it's going to look very similar. They're going to really reward quadrant one wins. Um, they're going to justify the decisions they make, not based on what they actually decided. You know, I've always said that the committee, really, they make a decision, and then they produce the justification for the decision. They don't make the decision based on the justification and then provide you that justification. I think, I think, I think that's what we'll see again, you know, inconsistency mm-hmm. uh, for the most part, but at the yeah, same they can time, justify an eight and eight Duke for all I care. Right. Yeah. They'll, they'll figure <laughs> it out. But yeah, it's, it's, you know, I think the biggest storyline with the committee will be, there will be teams that are closer to 500 than normal. Mm-hmm. And will the committee say, no, no go. Or will the committee, they can technically let in anyone this year. They don't even have to worry about them teams being over 500, but a team mm-hmm. like Maryland in particular is going to be like 13 and 12. Are you going to put in a 13 and 12 team? I wouldn't, but I think the committee will. And if the committee doesn't, that will prove that they don't care at all in the past who you've beaten as long as you have a pretty record, because there's no difference qualitatively between this Maryland team at 13 and 12 and a Maryland team in a normal year that played five more bye games and goes 18 and 13. Literally nothing different. <laughs> nothing at all. The metrics are the same. The quad, quadrant one is the same. But they'll put if they don't put in Maryland this year because their record isn't pretty enough, we'll know what it is. So it'll be an interesting uh, teaching exercise, I suppose. Obviously, we don't know the seeding or whatnot. But what, like, one to two seed right now do you see getting upset that first weekend? Yeah, I mean, obviously, obviously a heavily matchup dependent. Um, mm-hmm. I think Ohio State feels a little vulnerable. Right. They have this combination of 
not being elite on the defensive end, not having a guy who can take over, you know, they're big, but they're not like overwhelmingly large where you have, where, you know, an eight, nine game could would, would be overwhelmed by their size. I think Ohio state would be the most vulnerable one seed. Um, I also think on the two line, you know, I, I think a team like Houston is a little bit vulnerable just because like we've talked about, they haven't been tested as much. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they, they could wind up in a difficult spot, but yeah, I think those two would be the ones that jump out. Doesn't mean I don't believe in them as teams, but I think those are teams that are somewhat vulnerable. Okay. So I want to get your opinion on this. They announced that the first four will be played on Thursday and the real tournament, the second round, whatever you want to call it starts Friday and goes till Monday instead of the typical Thursday to Sunday schedule. Do you like that? Because it feels like that Thursday's, I mean, Thursday's better than Christmas of the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I mean, I'll miss it. I, I understand why it needs to happen. Yeah. And, like, it's, again, it's a protocol thing, and I get it, and it's not going to make me less sad about it. But, you know, I miss the Thursday. I, I think the Thursday is so much better than a, getting the Monday. Like, it's going to yeah. be nice to really be hoops, hoops on Monday, but so much it's better. Gonna be, it's it's just weird. It's not the same. But at the same time, I do think that the downwind effect of having the Sweet 16 mm-hmm. on Saturday and Sunday and having all those games be standalone will be an awesome, awesome uh, exposure for the sport. Yeah, that that is awesome because it's going to be awesome. I think I think the sport will get so much attention. People are you, people are Joneses for March Madness. They're going to see it back. I mean, I'm hopeful. It sounds like we're going to have some fans in the building as well, from what I'm hearing. Mm-hmm. You know, with that that's very exciting. I think you know potential to have you know a 20 capacity in an NBA arena with you know a, ma- you know, a, a huge game you know Gonzaga on the ropes against a, a, a high quality team I mean that's everything you can ask for it really is and I'm excited for that as much as losing that that Thursday stinks so I'll be locked in on Friday I'll be locked in on Saturday I'll be locked in every single day you give me so it doesn't really All matter right. my last question who's your dark horse to win the NCAA tournament so I, 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 I hate to go to the well again, but, you know, Loyola Chicago is, is sitting there and... Not Northwestern? <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I, I, think, I think at this point I should just pivot my rooting interest. Like, I've been around this loyal team of bunch. They're a fun, ton of fun to be around. I know, I know people that, you know, I'll just, it's four miles away from campus. I'll, I'll swing on. But, you know, I think Loyola, if you're looking for, the, like, the, the Cinderella dark horse mid-major, I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly Loyola. They're top 10 in Ken Palm. They're better, I think, in every way than, mm-hmm. than this final than the final four team was. And look, the final four team hit three buzzer beaters. And you're not probably gonna do that again. But you know, Loyola can play with anyone in the country. They defend you, they really pass, they play together, quarter motion league coach. I think that's a team. And then on the on the high major side, a team that I see is kind of a a Cinderella watch would be I'll say Tennessee. Um wow. maybe not not doesn't doesn't feel like a Cinderella, but they may be like a mm-hmm. four or a five. Yeah. I, I they just they haven't clicked every time they start to turn the corner mm-hmm. they take a step back and this team has top five talent in the country if it puts it all together come march they're gonna make a run and i wouldn't want to see them my 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 side of the thing so i i like i like tennessee a lot i think they could be dangerous i think uconn as well toss them in there as well they're gonna be underseated um mm-hmm. because of book Knight's injury now that james book Knight's back they're a fun team to watch and they're gonna be really tough to beat all right, Kevin. Well, this was a ton of fun. Thanks for coming on and go follow his Twitter page at CBB underscore central and go check out the podcast, CBB central podcast. Uh, Kevin, thanks again, man. Thank you. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. Always appreciate you having me on. Uh, looking forward to a great March. All right. Appreciate it, man.